All right, good morning, everyone. It only barely feels like morning for me. Uh, I was uh, naive enough to think that I had beaten the jet lag bug, as it were. And when I lay awake this morning at 3.30, I didn't get a wink of sleep. 3.30 in the morning, wide awake. There's nothing good on the television at 3.30 in the morning, by the way. There's very rarely anything good on television ever. But at 3.30 in the morning, it is a, it is a, it is a dry and barren land. Um, so anyway, I feel great. I, I feel great. I feel like I'm ready to go out to preach this morning, go out for dinner, and then go maybe get to bed in about two hours. So... Feeling good. Uh, let's just begin um, with, a, with a brief word of prayer. We've had some great prayers already this morning. I've never heard of the five-finger prayer. That's cool. I li- I'm going to teach that to my boys. They're going to like that. Uh, Father in heaven, we just ask that you be with us this morning as we spend some time with you. May you spend time with us. Uh, Father, this song is spoken directly to us. That act of faithfulness and forward-looking uh, that Abraham and Sarah had. Father, here we are. Uh, many thousands of years later, singing about their faithfulness. And we pray that somehow we could be similarly faithful, not because we are so good, but because you are so good. And we just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that we may be the people that you have called us and created us and redeemed us to be. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. From the opening chapter of the little book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, just a couple short sentences here to sort of set and summarize what we discussed yesterday morning. It says, when the Savior began His ministry, the popular conception of the Messiah, the what kind of conception? The popular conception of the Messiah and His work was such as wholly unfitted the people to receive Him. The popular idea, the popular concept of the Messiah was such that if they had clung to that idea, they they could not receive Jesus as the anticipated Messiah. Continuing on here. Uh, He was uh, uh, depicted as one who would be a great prince who should bring uh, all nations under the supremacy of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. A single other sentence here. Uh, It says that they, the various uh, 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 groups that we discussed yesterday, some of them were misled by the teaching of the rabbis and shared the popular expectation, there it is again, of an earthly kingdom. They could not comprehend the movements of Jesus. The anticipation and the expectation of first century Judaism in terms of a Messiah was very different than what they were actually going to get. Their expectations were destined to be dashed. And we discussed just briefly yesterday some of those groups. And of course, we need to be clear, it's not suggesting that that every single Jew fit neatly into one of these three categories, but that these three categories, historians and others have have, uh, demonstrated largely defined or at least described the the basic view that people had, a a theological view dealing with the cognitive dissonance that we discussed yesterday in terms of being the people of God but having to wrestle with what they saw with their eyes. And just remind me, help me to remember this morning, who were those four groups that we discussed yesterday? What was one of them? Okay, very good. We're familiar with them in the New Testament. The Pharisees were who? Uh, who exactly, how were they dealing with the cognitive dissonance between what they believed and what they saw? We are the people of God and our history is an uninterrupted uh, succession of subjugations to pagan powers. How did they deal with it? Okay, introversion, that's right. They became increasingly insular and they they became very uh, buried in their various traditions and the, the idiosyncrasies of Judaism and they effectively cut themselves off not only from the Gentile nations, that was a given, from the Gentiles, but even from their own people that didn't abide by the various theological constructs that they had put together. Okay, who else? What's our second group here? Sadducees, and how did they deal with a cognitive dissonance? If you can't beat them, what are we going to do? We're going to join them, and they essentially curried favor uh, with the Romans in order to deal with the, the situation. Uh, another group we don't really encounter, one of these two groups is who? The Essenes, we don't really encounter them in the New Testament, though we know that they were a uh, significant, not largely significant, but at least a a known entity in first century Judaism and ancient Palestine. And how are they dealing with this cognitive dissonance? Who are these people? They, they'd basically moved off to the... They'd moved away. They'd moved off to the, their little various communes and religious communities. 
And uh, we're, we're basically doing, in a, in a geographical sense, what the Pharisees were doing in a theological sense. The Pharisees were very insular in terms of their theological constructs and their national pride. There was a kind of strange patriotism mixed with, with Judaism, which we'll get to here in more in just a moment, or with Phariseeism. But with the Essenes, they just, they just basically left town. They, they, ins, they isolated themselves geographically as well as theologically and getting deeper and deeper into their various idiosyncrasies. And then the final group was who? Who was that? That's right, it was the Zealots, and we do encounter just at least a brief mention of Simon the Zealot in the New Testament, and the Zealots would have been, in some ways, sympathetic to the religious perspective of the Pharisees, not identical, but sympathetic, but they believed that the kingdom would be uh, uh, acquired and apprehended in no small degree by militaristic means, and so there was this sort of strange mix of theological insularity and uh, patriotism, national uh, 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 pride. And so these four groups, again, we don't want to pretend like every single Jew in the first century would fit neatly into one of these categories, but for the, 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 the others, the groups, the people that would follow Jesus and, and the, the, the individuals that would come to the synagogue and listen to the rabbis, while they may not have been a Pharisee or been a Sadducee or been an Essene or been a Zealot, they would have had sympathies that were consistent broadly with one or more of these camps. Everybody's basic perspective on what the Messiah is going to be and what he's going to do is wrong. It's wrong. This is why Ellen White says, and she's simply repeating what we know from Scripture and, and history, that the popular conception of what the Messiah was to be, uh, if, if we anticipate that, it's going to unfit us to receive what the Messiah actually is, and that's Jesus. Now, the anticipation here is of an earthly kingdom. What kind of a kingdom, everyone? An earthly kingdom. Now, let's just dwell very briefly on this. We'll talk more about it tomorrow. The whole, the language, the kingdom language is itself necessarily inherently liable to misunderstandings, right? The idea of a kingdom, especially in uh, first century Judaism, because um, the national power that would have been uh, the power that the, had subju uh, subjugated the Jews was who? Who was the great, uh, the iron monarchy of, what do we say? Rome. And so the disciples, you know, we have to understand the sort of breadth, the magnitude, the sophistication. Uh, Rome was in many ways not unlike the modern United States of America. There, there's a bit of a saying that uh, I've encountered as I've traveled around the world, and that is that when the United States sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold. That our influence is such that it's, uh, it's, it's ubiquitous almost. Um, or at least Western, uh, the Western elements is almost ubiquitous. Well, Rome would have been very similar to this. In the mind of the disciples, when Jesus starts talking about the kingdom, the natural default for the disciples would have been Rome. Rome was the classic kingdom. It was the quintessential kingdom. It, it was, it was if, if Rome is big and Rome is mighty and Rome is strong and Rome is sophisticated, then what, pray tell, must the kingdom of heaven be? The kingdom of heaven must be bigger still and stronger still and more sophisticated. The kingdom of heaven must just be more of what Rome is. And we, we know this from the New Testament because we find a variety of instances in the New Testament where the disciples have obviously plainly, radically misunderstood the nature of the kingdom that Jesus came to advocate. For example, um, even after the resurrection... This is Acts chapter 1, right there in the very beginning. This is after the resurrection, just prior to the ascension. There is a question that is just burning on the hearts and minds of the disciples. They just can't wait to ask this question. And, and the question that is burning in their hearts is, Lord, will you at this time... Does anyone know it? Will you at this time... What was, what was on their hearts? It's, it's the single question they ask. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to what? To Israel. Now, beloved, I want you to think about it. That's after three and a half years with Jesus and after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, and after the 40 days. And they're still like, is this it, Jesus? Is this the time where we get to start lopping the heads of the Romans off? We have the, there are so many little cameos in Scripture where we know that this is effectively what the disciples were after. When Jesus was, was finally and tragically apprehended in the Garden of Gethsemane, you just get this sense of... of, of uh, release um, this almost catharsis as, as Simon is able to pull out his sword and begin to, he just can't wait this is what we've all been waiting for game on and uh, they're just, this, is, this is it, right? on one occasion in, in Matthew chapter 18 
Uh, Jesus begins, he hears a dispute among the disciples. Listen to the nature of the dispute. Who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But because, of course, it's, we're talking about a kingdom. The desire, uh, or the, 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 the absolute default mode for any kind of a kingdom would be to be the greatest, to be the highest. I mean, Rome is the quintessential grand kingdom of antiquity, and who wouldn't want to, to sit on the right and on the left? We find that in another place. One of the uh, uh, mothers, the, the mother of uh, uh, the sons of, um, help me out here, Zebedee, comes and says, Jesus, I just have a small request. Oh, what's your request? My sons could one sit on the right and one sit on the left in the kingdom. In the kingdom. And so the disciples, as they are seeing the various things that Jesus is doing, and Ellen White brings this out forcefully in The Desire of Ages, virtually everything that Jesus does, does is understood against the backdrop of a basic misunderstanding of what the kingdom of heaven is. So, for example, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, when Jesus feeds the multitudes, the disciples are thinking this will be great on the field of battle because we won't have to bring sandwiches. I mean, think of how dexterous and light and nimble we will be. We have the cafeteria travels with us. Um, when Jesus would heal somebody who was sick, this, this would be seen through the first century perspective of this will be great. When one of our uh, soldiers falls on the field of battle, Jesus can restore him right on the field of battle. And then the creme de la creme of his various miracles to the tomb of Lazarus a full three days after he died. He can raise the dead. We will be unstoppable. So everything that Jesus does is understood in this light. No wonder that Jesus frequently employed the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like... And he said the strangest of things. The kingdom of heaven is like. This refrain is repeated over and over again, uh, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like. And you can just imagine there the disciples waiting, you know, with bated breath. Yeah, the kingdom, Jesus. Tell us about the kingdom. That's what we want to hear about. Tell us about the kingdom. Well, the kingdom of heaven, fellas, is like um, because there's no easy referent. Because the kingdom language is itself liable to be misunderstood as more and greater of what Rome is. The kingdom language itself is liable to a, a grand misunderstanding. Jesus would say, fellas, the kingdom of heaven is like ah, a mustard seed. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't that just get your blood racing? Doesn't it just make you want to charge into battle? Yeah, me too. I mean, can you imagine the disciples? Can you just hear their sigh of disappointment? Yeah, the kingdom of heaven is... Uh. <laughs> but Jesus isn't done yet. In Matthew chapter 13, he's just getting started. Yes, fellas, listen. The kingdom of heaven is like... yeast. Yeah. Yeah? It's like yeast, and Jesus is off to the races. You know, he's like, oh yeah, because, you know, a seed, it's small, and you put it in the ground, and the birds, and the disciples are hearing none of this. All they heard was, M mustard, what? The kingdom of heaven is like Rome. The kingdom of heaven is like power. The kingdom of heaven is like strength. The kingdom of heaven is a mustard seed. Yeah, the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who found a treasure buried in a field. The kingdom of heaven is, is like a net. These are not exactly the kinds of things to set the blood racing. I mean, can you imagine charging into battle? East, you know. <laughs> Mustard seed. It just doesn't. We wouldn't name our football teams this, would we? You know, the, the Baltimore yeast. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not going to work. It's just not working here. So the, the reason that G, Jesus has to employ these various seemingly unusual analogies is because he's trying to show distinction between the common conception of a kingdom and, by extension, a Messiah and what was actually the case. No wonder, as Jesus stood there, and you will recall, we are sitting there on that mountainside, aren't we? We're sitting there and we have an expectation. We may not be a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a Zealot or an Essene, but we are, our sympathies and our cognitive dissonances are with one of these camps and we're listening. 
And there was this expectation and almost electricity in the air when this provocative, young, largely unknown rabbi, some had heard about the wedding and the water to wine, some had heard about, you know, there was reports of thunder and this is my son or something weird like that. So there was this sense of kind of expectation or electricity. So we're listening there as we sit on that, that hillside and we, we are anticipating something. And so here's Jesus, 18 years in preparation, and the very first thing that he wants to say to people has to do with the kingdom. The very first words out of his mouth. And in the, in the inauguration, the initiation of his public ministry, what will he say? The better part of 20 years in preparation, and, and what was it that he said? We, we just talked about this yesterday. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs what? Is the kingdom of heaven. And... These words, again, in the, in, the, in the words of Ellen White, were strange and new. Let's say those words together. They were strange and new. They were radical. They were like a bombshell dropped on first century Judaism. No, it's not the Pharisees. No, it's not the Sadducees. No, it's not the Essenes. No, it's not the Zealots. And I am, I am tempted, and I'm thankful that time doesn't allow me to do it, um, to demonstrate that there are at least broad analogies in modern times for each of, in modern uh, contemporary Christianity that would be well represented by each of these groups. And Jesus did not align himself with any of them. He had a distinct mission. He had a distinct mission. And I would even go so far as to say that with Jesus' distinct mission and distinct message came a distinct methodology. Oh, that sounds very sophisticated. Doesn't that make me sound smart? Yeah, but I think it's absolutely true. Jesus, the distinctiveness of his mission... Do Seventh-day Adventists have a distinct mission, yes or no? Oh, forgive me for being unimpressed with that. Do Seventh-day Adventists have a distinct mission, yes or no? Yeah, we have a very distinct, a distinctive, a peculiar mission. And do we have a distinctive and peculiar message... So I'm just, I'm just throwing out there that it may also be wise for us to consider that our methodology does not have to be like the various methodologies of other people who aren't promoting our distinctive mission and message. Making sense, everyone? Uh, our message should be... Cons our methodology and our message should make sense. They should be consistent. They should comport, is the term. Anyway, I could spend more time on that, but I won't. But the point is this. Jesus here speaks directly to the issue of the kingdom. It's the very first burden on his, on his heart. Now let me just read here a statement from the pen of Ellen White. Listen to this one. It says, His words, this is Thoughts Amount of Blessing, page 147, written it right in the front of my Bible because it's just so important to me. His words, Jesus' words, had struck at the very root. Where had, where had they struck? The very root of their former ideas and opinions. To obey his teaching, Jesus' teaching, his new teaching, would require a change in all. What's the word, everyone? In all of their habits of thought and action. Pfft, are you kidding me? You want to, uh, it, it, gets, it gets even more amazing. Would, uh, she continues, it would bring them into collision with their religious teachers, for it would involve, now listen to this language, tell me what this sounds like, for it would involve the overthrow of the whole structure that for generations the rabbis had been rearing. Now what does that sound like? The overthrow of the structure. What does that sound like? That's a revolution, man. See, Jesus on top of Mount, on the Mount of Blessing is not only revelatory, he's revolutionary. Listen to the language. The overthrow of the structure that for generations the rabbis had been rearing. The guy is the, he is the quintessential revolutionary. She continues. In the Sermon on the Mount, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education. It wasn't so much what Jesus had to teach them, it's what he had to teach them how to unlearn. And frankly, as an evangelist, this is very much the case in today's day and age. If you give me, as, a, as, a, as an evangelist, as somebody whose full-time job is an apologist and evangelist for the church, if you give me somebody who's basically a blank religious slate, so to speak, that person is usually, not always, usually easier to win to Jesus, win to the Seventh-day Adventist message than somebody who comes with various uh, packages of theological uh, perspective. Does that make sense? And, and I think it's the same here. Absolutely the same here. Because it's not just what we're teaching, it's what we're unteaching. Listen to that language. Had to undo 
the work that had been wrought by false education and to give his hearers a right conception of two things, of his kingdom and his character. Okay, let's say those two things together. Of his kingdom and his character. Well, what does he have to undo? He has to undo all of this. He has to undo all of this insularity of the Pharisees and the, 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 the worldliness of the Sadducees and the, the militarism and patriotism, uh, an unfounded militarism and patriotism of the, of the uh, uh, zealots. And he has to undo this, uh, this uh, sort of isolationism, geographical isolationism of the Essenes. He has, to, he has to rewire everything. As we mentioned yesterday, just briefly, Jesus, yes, he turned over tables, but Jesus had to do something far more difficult than turning over a table... He had to turn over the way that people were thinking about him, his kingdom, and the character of God. And so when he stands on the mountain there, he is speaking into a cauldron. Speaking into a cauldron of cultural, religious, social, psychological. It's a mess. And what's he going to say? The very first thing he says, I'm just so impressed with the fact that the first words out of Jesus' mouth are... Happy is he who recognizes his deep spiritual poverty because heaven was made for somebody like him. These are strange and new words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first words out of his mouth deal with the issue of the kingdom. He goes on to speak about the kingdom six times in the Sermon on the Mount. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. It was a recurrent refrain with him. You have been, you have heard, but I say, you have heard, but I say, you have heard, but I say, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. He's an electrician. He's rewiring. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is invite you to go with me to Matthew chapter 5. And I would like to introduce you to what might be new. I hope it's not novel, but it is new for many of you, I think. A new way of looking at the, the Beatitudes. And... Uh, I think that we sometimes have the tendency, many of us, in our perfunctory study of Scripture, um, I'm going to suggest it's perfunctory, to view the Beatitudes as isolated, unrelated drops, little pearls of wisdom. Um, we all sort of have our favorite books of the Bible, things that just really resonate with us. A good friend of mine, Matthew Parra, his favorite book is the book of Proverbs, or one of his favorite books. I, I wrestle with the book of Proverbs. Because I feel like it's like really dense, 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 dense bread. Um, you read a chapter in Proverbs and it's like you could spend your whole life on those things. I, 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 ah, I just, to me, I, I don't, res I love it. I think it's part of the word of God. But, but one of the difficulties that I have with the Proverbs is, is that there's no line for me. I mean, there are passages where there definitely is a line. There's definitely a follow the sequence. But often it's just this little pearl of wisdom. Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Hmm, meditate on that for the rest of your life. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's so thick, it's so dense. And we, I think, sometimes are tempted to view the Beatitudes that way, as these nice little, as we used the illustration yesterday, of the cross stitch with the bluebirds and the, and the sun above the toilet in the guest bathroom. Oh, that's so sweet. Hoo, 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 hoo. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It, it's so nice. It's like a little Hershey's kiss of spirituality. It's like chicken soup for the soul, first century stuff. No. Watch what Jesus does here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very first step in, in everyone's spiritual journey is to recognize their spiritual poverty. Everybody's journey begins here. Everybody's journey begins in the same place. Only those who recognize that at some level they are spiritually impoverished will go looking for a solution to their impoverishment. Everybody's journey begins in the same place. So when Jesus speaks here on the, on the, uh, from the summit of, of, of the New Covenant Sinai, he is not speaking only to the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Essenes or the Zealots. He's speaking to humanity. He's speaking to the Chinese. He's speaking to the Africans. He's speaking to the South Americans. Your spiritual journey begins when you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a savior. I suppose that's even true of those of us that work here in the general conference office. That your spiritual journey has to begin and in a great degree advance precisely to the degree that you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a savior. That you are spiritually impoverished. Can you say amen to that? But here's my suggestion. Jesus does not give here isolated, unrelated uh, drops of sort of spiritual wisdom. But there is a sequence. Entertain this idea with me if you would. That there is actually a sequential development to the Beatitudes. Notice the next one. He says, blessed are the, what does your Bible say? Blessed are they that 
mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This will become clear as we develop the sequence. But, but everyone's spiritual journey begins with a recognition of their basic spiritual impoverishment. Whether you're the thief hanging on the cross, right? What did he know? All he knew is that he was scared and he was in trouble. He knew he was nailed to a tree. He knew he wasn't getting off of that tree. He was absolutely terrified. And in that moment of terror, he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. To which Jesus replies, Verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Where would we be without the story of the thief on the cross? Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Where would we be without this story? Many of us would have given up in despair. But what does the thief know? All he knows is he's a sinner. He's nailed to a tree. He's scared out of his mind. And this guy can do something about it. Save me, I perish. Okay. His journey begins right there. Everybody's journey begins there. But for those who aren't nailed to a tree, which is most of us, fortunately, there is a progression in our spiritual experience. Not only do we recognize our spiritual poverty, but given sufficient time and spiritual maturation, we will begin to mourn our spiritual condition, to lament our spiritual condition. And so Jesus not only says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he then says, blessed are they that mourn that condition. I would like to suggest that this is the experience of repentance. A genuine repentance where we repent not only for the consequences of our actions, but for the actions themselves. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed, blessed are they that recognize in an increasingly deep and, and resonant fashion their spiritual impoverishment. Friends, we need to meditate on this. What, what, what was the thing that Ellen White said? I, I had my paper here yesterday, but you'll, you'll be familiar with it. There is not a point that needs to be repeated more frequently or more emphatically. You know this statement, except the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good work. She says this is what we need to dwell on. Our fallenness. And, by extension, God's awesomeness. This is what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah goes in, he had been prior to his entrance into the temple, as we discussed yesterday. Woe to you, you're like Sodom. Woe to you, you keep building bigger and bigger houses. Woe to you, you get up early in the morning just to drink. Woe to all of you sinners! And then he goes into the temple. Woe is me. Woe is me. Beloved, we need to have that experience on a daily. Is that even often enough? An awareness of what we would be without God. In the words of John Wesley, but for the grace of God, there go I. So first we recognize our spiritual poverty. By the way, this can only happen by the infilling of the spirit. It's only the goodness of God that leads to repentance. We then mourn that spiritual condition. And now watch this. Next verse, third beatitude. There are eight of them. He says, blessed are the, what does it say? Meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. After we've recognized our spiritual poverty, mourned that spiritual condition, we begin to realize that everyone else is fundamentally not dissimilar to us, but similar to us. That we are all basically the same. And if we could really come to believe that the blackness or whiteness or pinkness or tanness or yellowness or redness of your skin did not matter at all, or your tallness or your shortness or your broadness or your, your bigness or your intelligence, if we could really begin to see that these things are artificial, these distinctions are artificial, they're, I'm not suggesting that they're not genuine, but they're artificial in the sense that they don't distinguish someone as human versus subhuman. Are we together on that? They're conventions. There's an artificiality to these distinctions. If we can begin to realize, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. You're, and you, and uh, this should, what's the word here, everyone? This should impact the way that we treat those around us. This is a sign of spiritual maturity. How do we treat those that we are in many ways dissimilar, or that in many ways we are unlike, but in the most fundamental way, we are exactly like. Yeah? This is why I love Paul in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I love it when Paul says, we no longer judge any man according to the flesh. He says, well, it's just, we found it to be an unreliable guide. If we look at who a man is, we've just found it to be totally unreliable because we have seen the drunk become sober. We have seen the thief become honest. We no longer view people according to the flesh. In, what we've got to try and do is view others, and here's the trickiest part, 
ourselves through the eyes of Jesus. Yeah? You see, beloved, when I came into Veggie's restaurant, I was a purple-haired, tattooed, pierced punk rocker. Yellow hair, blue hair, green hair, no hair, long hair. I mean, I was, I was crazy. You would not have looked at me and thought, you know what? That is certainly a candidate for a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist. I think he could travel around the world. <laughs> and uh, I think he could... Pr- I mean, you would have been stretching the bounds of credulity to say, he could be saved someday. But then God does something amazing. God gets a hold of a person and he, I mean, literally in two weeks, I read the great controversy, I'm, my whole life is turned upside down. I mean, he's just, God just like, I love the Lord. God is awesome. Let's go to prayer meeting. I mean, it just happened overnight. Can you say amen to that? And when we begin to realize, as Paul says, we don't judge people as they are. We, we see them through the eyes of Christ. This creates in us an attitude of meekness. Should But now look at where we're at in our spiritual journey. We have recognized our spiritual condition. We have mourned that condition as a sign of increasing spiritual maturity and repentance. This gives us an attitude of meekness and commonality with those around us. But we realize suddenly that there is a deficiency. There is something that we so desperately need. In fact, we need it so much that Jesus uses the language of hunger. There's something that we need that we we know we ourselves do not possess and could not possess. What do we need? What are we hungering and thirsting for? Righteousness. Jesus' language is purposefully picturesque here. Hunger and thirst. There is a, there is a deepness here. There is a, a, a basicality here. This is something you have to have. Righteousness. And beloved, I tell you, everybody, I, human beings tend to be very pendulous. I'm not telling you something you don't know. We, 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 we're like Peter is the classic pendulous example, you know. He goes from, you will never wash my feet. That will not be happening, Lord, to would you, maybe a little shampoo job, maybe everything. I mean, he just, you just swing from here and to here. And we, we, people tend to be very pendulous. Um, many people come into the church and uh, they're very rigid. And, and I cannot believe that there is ranch dressing on your plate. It's very unsettling to me. And we're, uh, and I came in that way. I came in, that's where I came in from. When Josh, God bless him, when he brought me into the church, he brought me to this crazy camp meeting, God bless him. I still had earrings in my ears. He brings me to this camp meeting in the middle of beep, state, and we went to this ministry, beep, and all of these crazy people were coming up to me and saying, are you a house church or a conference church? I was like, I don't know. I had no idea. I had no idea. So I went to Josh and I said, Josh, am I home church or conference church? He said, you're home church. So then the people would say, are you home church? I'd say, I'm, I'm home church. Good on you. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, that was me. I mean, I, that's, the, that's the experience that I came into. And we used to sit, I'm not telling you a lie, Josh and I used to sit in, on Sabbath morning in a living room. I mean, I'm a purple-haired punk rocker, fresh out of the world. We used to sit on Sabbath morning with like five other elderly ladies. And we would watch videos. Sabbath morning. You know, when when Josh gave me the Bible study on the remnant, I thought, we are definitely the remnant. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we... (laughs) we felt like the remnant, I'll tell you that. I mean, it was just like, it was me and Josh and the the old ladies. And we would just... (laughs) We'd sit there, and one day, I'm driving through town, and I see the strangest of things. It was over there on South Canyon Boulevard. This, I was driving, minding my own business, just came back from rock climbing, and... Uh, 